Thank you, Nikaji. And thanks to all the floor members uh, for inviting me here. And in particular, as you said, uh, it's been a long weekend. They say that money and power are the two most important things. And both those in India are controlled by women. <laughs> you know, if you see in uh, today banking in India, all the big banks are run by women. Whether it's SBI, ICICI, Access Bank, and uh, you have uh, Bank of India. You know, nearly 65 to 70 percent of Indian banking is controlled by women. And I'm sure that's in good hands because women know how to manage money better than men. Also, if you see in power, of course, whether it is uh, Jailalita, whether it's now Vasundra Rajay, or whether it's uh, Didi, or High Command, or whoever else, <laughs> we are always, uh, you know, wherever women take charge, you know, they really know how to run things. You know, on, on, on uh, just a lighter note, one of my friends was actually walking on the street, he came across, uh, you know, this uh, uh, small, uh, uh, you know, lamp, and he picked it up and dropped it, and there comes out a genie. So then he said, uh, then the genie asks my friend, uh, you know, what can I do for you? I'll give you three wishes, whatever you want. So the first wish he asks is, I want to be the strongest man in the world. So poof, he becomes, you know, like, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, he becomes very strong. <laughs> then he asks, I want the fastest car in the world. So then he said, okay, here it is, a Ferrari, here it comes. And then the third thing he says, I want to be the smartest person in the world. Then he immediately turns him into a, a lady. <laughs> so I think women certainly are much uh, smarter than men in uh, more ways than one. And uh, I'm here to talk to you not about our business, because I think that can be quite boring. I thought I'll talk to you something about uh, beyond business. I mean, what motivates me, what drives me. Uh, and I think it is applicable in a way, and I know uh, Flo, briefly, in terms of the work you do, is about uh, women empowerment and bringing women ahead in, in business, in society, in all aspects, in all spheres of life. And uh, therefore, I believe that, uh, you know, doing things beyond what one is asked to is something uh, and, uh, is, is extremely critical. So I thought I'd just share my journey in this direction. Just before I go, I'll take just a minute to talk about our business, so because then you can relate. Uh, you know, GBK is a primarily an infrastructure company. Uh, we are also into resources and uh, other businesses. In uh, infrastructure, we are into power generation, into airports, into uh, toll roads, uh, into ports, into railways. In resources, we are into coal mining, oil and gas, and we have other businesses also like hotels, life sciences, real estate, etc. But this is something which I think is very important for me, which I believe in very strongly. Because I believe the job of leadership is not just to make money, but to make meaning. And I think this is the fundamental focus of my talk today. And uh, I will just explain to you, in my own way, that in every small thing or big thing that I do, how I think and why I think it's important that everybody thinks like that. Just to again set the context, I have done this uh, in terms of creating impact in three different areas, whether it's in CII, sorry, whether it's in GVKR projects. In every project that I've done, I've always thought beyond uh, you know, the call of duty and seeing what can we do. As part of our GVK foundation, which is a charitable part of our business, and also uh, there's a three-letter word here, which I'm not supposed to uh, utter here, which you can read. <laughs> which uh, I've been quite, quite actively involved for the last 15-20 uh, years. So I'm sure you can read that. So first, when I, when I the first uh, infrastructure project in the country was uh, uh, in the early 1990s. It's the first private power plant built in India. Uh, GVK was fortunate to build that. It's a plant called Jagrupadu Power Plant in Andhra Pradesh. When we, took, when we actually went there to see the site, you know, this is how it looked. It was, uh, it's not very clear, but it was like a, you know, a really like a lunar crater. Right next to it, we had a paper a plant, which in those days used to have a lot of pollutants, black and, you know, smelly pollutants. And they used to be dumped into this site. So when we went there, we were shocked and said, how can we build anything here? But unfortunately, in that region, there was no other land, so we took it up. 
And what was important in those early, in those days, in 1990s, we went to get our project financed. There was not much money available in India, so we had to go to international banks. So we went to a bank called IFC Washington, which is part of the World Bank. And they were very particular about environment. Today, of course, in India, environment has become a big subject, important subject, but 20 years ago, you know, people wouldn't focus much on it. And they said that we won't finance Indian projects. So we said, why? So they said that you have absolutely no respect for the environment. And, uh, you know, people, especially business people, they come and tell us tall stories. They give us all these, uh, you know, fancy presentations. But when, when it comes to action on the ground, you don't do anything. And we said, no, we somehow convinced them and said that, you know, we will uh, certainly keep up to it. And we went about uh, building this power plant. And at that time, I was, I'm also quite a hardcore uh, environmentalist. Uh, because I believe we need to leave a better world for our children than what we have inherited. And uh, so therefore, it was very important that using this project to create a message. Uh, and therefore, what we said is that taking the worst possible site that one can think of, why can't we make it into an oasis, a botanical garden? And today, you know, what you see in Jegrupadu is actually the same site. We have, of course, uh, uh, more than a hundred thousand different types of uh, plants. We have lakes. See, it's, it's very simple. In a power plant, you're supposed to build a water reservoir. So why do you build it in a square shape? We just build it like a lake. And then we have boating there. We have the only zoo and a bird sanctuary of any power plant that I know. It's an actually registered zoo and bird sanctuary. So when people come there, Nobody, frankly, is interested to go to the power plant. <laughs> you know, it's actually, they, they, they enjoy it so much. It's become a site for tours, for children to come. For various uh, people who visit that area, they always want to come and see the power plant. And more importantly, when I mean impact, what it has done is, for example, uh, you know, there are so many, so many other projects around. And also across the country, a lot of my friends, and after we, uh, people come to, came to know about it, uh, including many big business houses, they sent people to see this, and they have then started adopting better practices. And this became kind of a catalyst for change. So one is, I'm happy that we were able to achieve this, but more importantly, I think this has triggered other people to adapt similar practices. And uh, with this 2007, in 2007, sorry, 1997, IFC Washington in their uh, you know, balance sheet uh, identified this power plant as uh, the best uh, power plant in the world from an environmental angle. So, and I think this is just one example, is when I started my journey and I said that let's do something beyond what we need to do. And these are some of the images uh, that are there of the power plant. Uh, and it's uh, something, uh, if you go, will be, this is quite spectacular. Uh, you know, the other thing which came up uh, in our projects was Mumbai International Airport. And uh, this was a very, very interesting project. So I'm going to take a little more time explaining to you about it because we were fortunate that we just recently we uh, you know, inaugurated the new terminal. This is actually the shape of the land. If you see this, uh, our airport land is in this shape. And it's right in the middle of the city. And what those colors denote is basically the different uses of the land. This pretty much when we took over in 2006, every single square meter of land was occupied. There was no vacant land. The total amount of land that we had was uh, 2,000 acres, out of which you know, we had 300 acres of slums, and uh, we had another 300 acres uh, which was occupied by various other agencies, which uh, you know, left us with only about 1,400 acres of land. So, so we had uh, a net land No, 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 don't, don't worry, I'm, I'm very relaxed. Uh, I think all of you are a little more worked out, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry about it. So just to explain, and this is important, that's why I stopped for a minute, is that we have total 2,000 acres of land, out of which 600 is already occupied by slums, and it was given away to Air India, etc. So we, had only, we have only 1,400 acres of land. And out of 1,400 acres, not only we have limited land, we have every single acre is occupied. So what do we do? We were actually, uh, we went through a bid and when we actually took over the project, 
it was in May 3rd, uh, 2006 that uh, I went to Mumbai and I moved to Mumbai then because it was a very complex project. <coughs> and at that time we had no airport experience. You know, like most Indian businesses when we get into a new business, unless you get the business, why will you hire people? And so I went with just one person. There were two people, myself and a retired person from Airports Authority of India. And in May 3rd, they actually handed over the operation of Mumbai Airport. It was the largest airport in India and uh, said that you have to operate it. So here it is, just imagine one of you just goes to an airport and say, okay, now we start operating it. <laughs> so apart from those challenges, you know, even the land which was there, the uh, demarcation wasn't correct. It was all, uh, uh, you know, wrong uh, boundaries. We had more than 220 litigations, all these challenges. And because of this limited land, it is the most constrained airport anywhere in the world. There is no other airport which is as constrained as this. As this. Just to give you kind of a, a sense, just as a comparison, if you see Bangalore airport compared to our 1400 acres as 4000 acres, uh, Delhi has 5123, Hyderabad is 5500. And if you go to international airports, Bangkok has 10,000, Dallas has 18, Kuala Lumpur has 30,000. So just to give you a sense of typically, airports are all about land. The more land you have, the bigger the airport can get. So we had very limited land and in terms of capacity utilization, we obviously had uh, a lot of people. So it was a huge challenge uh, for us. The other challenge which I said was uh, about uh, slum rehabilitation. So we have nearly 75,000 families who are living in our airport land, which is nearly 400,000 people. It is more than an MLA constituency who <laughs> lives there. And so we said, uh, you know, we took on the challenge of rehabilitating them. It is, uh, you know, we already built 18,000 tenements, which are basically homes, uh, to start shifting people. We just started shifting. And uh, we, over time, will shift all 75,000. And it is it will be the single largest you know, shifting of people anywhere in the world. So not only do we have no land, but then we have to shift the rehabilitate people and do all these things. And since all land was occupied, what do you do? How do you manage? So what the only thing we could do, literally, was pretty much demolish everything and rebuild everything while it was, while it was in operation. So it's like, uh, you know, you're living in your home and uh, you, you want to demolish your home and rebuild it while you're living in it. So I think you can imagine, uh, I'm sure uh, you'll not enjoy it much. Uh, and so, for example, if you had 10 acres which was with uh, Air India, we would go to them. We'll say that the same facilities with had 10 acres, we'll build in 2 acres at our cost. And then we spend money, normally what happens is, you know, everybody wants the best. They want the gold standard, they don't want to compromise on anything. <laughs> So we had to agree to whatever they said, we build it, demolish their facilities and then we get back 8 acres. So we literally quote unquote were manufacturing land so that we could build what we wanted. So it was an extremely challenging project. In comparison, let us say for example, uh, you know any other airport in India including Delhi, they just they had an open land, they just had to build. They didn't have to go through all these challenges. You know with all these challenges in 2006, you know, I, I just want to tell you, when I was in college in the US, uh, in the 80s, uh, and I was, uh, I used to fly back uh, every year, like all parents, you know, you know, beta, beta, come every three months, six months, one year. So I used to come once a year. And, uh, you know, normally in those days, the only two international airports were, I think, maybe three, uh, Delhi, Bombay, Madras. And so I used to come through uh, Delhi, uh, Bombay. And uh, one of those flights, normally when you stay abroad for quite a long time, you forget how our country is. And you know, I stayed there for a year when I was coming back. We had a big storm in Bombay. So the flight landed in, uh, in Pakistan, in uh, Karachi. So I had a person sitting next to me, who was an American, and he became quite friendly. So we just started going out and then, uh, you know, when you walk into Karachi, the airport was horrible. So, you know, as usual, that Pakistan bashing, you know, we get a big kick out of it. So, well, you know, I was telling this, this guy, saying, look at this, you know, this country is horrible. Uh, it's, uh, you've got a terrible airport. They don't know, even a small thing like this, they can't do. And then, lo and behold, after some time, we got into our aircraft, landed in Bombay. The minute I got out of the aircraft, I just ran away from this person. <laughs> because it was ten times worse than Karachi. So, I remember in those days, uh, I used to, I, I thought, I looked up and said, 
God, can somebody do something about this? <laughs> so I think it looks like, you know, in, uh, I don't know in Hindi what you say, but we say, Tadastu. Yeah, so I think God said, Tadastu. So let's see what you can do. So I took it up very seriously. For me, my life was about creating change. And so even though with all these challenges in 2006, this is the vision which we set up for the airport is to be one of the world's best airports that you know consistently delights customers and be the pride of Mumbai. And when we actually came up with this vision, most people laughed at it. And people who knew the airport said, how is this possible? Is this guy trying to fool somebody and raise some money or something like that? Or, uh, you know, it is impossible. You just can't do it. So we said, fine, you know, whatever the negatives are, just keep your head down, focused. And most important and most difficult thing is uh, whether it's you in your home, in your family, when you want to do something, you have to get their commitment or in your business. The most important thing is to get everybody aligned. And once you have everybody aligned, then the task becomes easier. And uh, the, as long as you're, you have clarity of vision, I think that's most important. And that's something which is uh, always I believe in. Once you set a